Hello, everyone. Welcome to our worship here on our YouTube channel. If you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to like the video and also subscribe to the channel. Um, that gives you full access to the channel uh, and notifications when we get brand new videos in the next coming weeks. We're going to start back up the Lunch with the Pastor video uh, Bible study series, uh, so you'll be getting notifications for that, notifications for our worship services, and any other videos that get posted on YouTube. I try to keep up with any announcements, that kind of stuff, new things that are happening inside the church. I always want to use our YouTube channel for those things. So uh, if you if you haven't done so already, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel, like the video. Liking the video allows it to uh, go out to the world and 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 hopefully uh, show up on, on different people's uh, YouTube channel pages um, so that they can see what's going on here. Um, and hopefully uh, they get a word from God uh, in, in what's posted on our YouTube channel. So uh, it's an easy evangelistic tool that you can use uh, to help out. Um, the other the other two things I want to talk about, first off, if you haven't been out to our children's library yet, I encourage you to do so. It is a blast. The kids are having a wonderful time. Rain or shine, there's lots of stuff to do over there. Please come out, celebrate, worship, and be in fellowship with the kids in our community. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, the last thing I do want to make a comment on is that, as you all know, we went to two services on Sunday mornings when COVID hit. And the reason was so that we could separate a little bit our congregation. Because if everyone showed up at the same time, we were not going to be able to social distance inside of our sanctuary. So having two identical services allowed us to separate the congregation out so that everyone was able to worship in the sanctuary without having to worry about social distancing because we could social distance with two services. No, we no longer need to do that. We no longer need the second service. So the church council voted this past week to take the service that we created for COVID, which is the nine o'clock service in the morning on Sunday mornings, and turn it into a brand new service that's going to happen at a different time during the week. Uh, I, there's not a lot of details right now, but the bottom line is that this brand new service is going to be geared towards children and young families and young adults. So it's going to be a brand new style of worship. It's a brand new worship that I personally have never been a part of. Um, it's going to be real interesting. It's going to be a lot of fun and it's going to be a huge learning curve. Um, so I'm putting together a committee over the next uh, over the next week or so to put that service together in the next month or two. Um, but what that also means is that we don't need the nine o'clock service on Sunday mornings. So in two weeks, which will be July 18th, all right. On July 18th, we are going to go take our Sunday morning schedule and take it back to pre-COVID times, which means that we're going to go back to a 930 Sunday school hour start, which has that fellowship time built in at the very beginning to get coffee and donuts and fellowship. Uh, we may even have uh, we may even sing a couple hymns together, do some prayer time together, and then we'll break up into our Sunday school classes. And then we'll have our regular worship service in the sanctuary at 1045 on Sunday morning. So that's going to happen on the 18th of July. So you can mark that down in your calendar. You can write it down and, and know that on July 18th, we will be back to having one service on Sunday mornings. And if you would spend a little extra time with me in prayer about this brand new service, we hope and pray that it will reach exactly who we're looking for. But more importantly, we hope it reaches exactly who God is trying to get us to reach people that may not have been able to be reached by a church, people that haven't come to a church in years, people that have never come to a church. We hope that all of those types of people, everyone in our community can be, come and be a part of this brand new service that we're trying to create. So pray with me, pray with our committees, pray with our leadership that this is a fruitful and godly inspired endeavor uh, to bring new people into relationship with our creator and with our savior. With all that being said, I know it was a little longer than normal, but Let's begin our worship service by singing, shall we? This morning, we're going to start off our worship by singing, I Stand Amazed in the Presence, hymn number 371. Let's sing together. Is my Savior's love. 
verse, uh, our scripture this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Hear the words of the gospel this morning. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about every, anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we say, thanks be to God. Will you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful opportunity to come together and worship your name, be, be in presence with each other, even if it is through a technological uh, way, even if it isn't on Sunday morning. We know that your spirit transcends time and you can bring us all together as if we are worshiping together in our physical capacity in the sanctuary together. So, Father, we just pray that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us no matter where we are watching this video, in our cars, in traffic, in our homes, in our living rooms, in our dining rooms wherever we are, would you send your spirit upon us, break open our hearts and our ears so that the words that are about to be spoken would truly become your words for your people. We pray all this in Christ's precious name. Amen. All right, so over the past couple of weeks, we have spent time discussing what it means to be connected. We've looked at how God created us, not just to be in connection with him, not that God-sized hole, right? It's not just that, of course we've got that, but that we were also made to be in connection with others, right? Think about it. When we read the creation story in Genesis, if you remember the story, right? Six days of creation, right? As he goes through creation, every time he does something, what does, he say? What does God say? It is good. It is good. It is good. It is good, right? Until he creates humans. Now, this is not a statement of humans are bad. It's the statement God looks at man and he goes, man is good, but it's not good for him to be alone. And we get the story of Adam and Eve, right? We can make all sorts about jokes, uh, about husbands being women's first true first child, right? <laughs> but putting those jokes aside for the moment, what God was actually saying is that unlike all the rest of creation, man was created to be in relationship. He was created to be in community. Humans were made to be connected to other humans. And so we have this statement from the literal dawn of creation telling us that connection, I, the connection between human beings is vital to us being what God intended us to be. For us to be called good in the sight of God, we must be in connection. We cannot be by ourselves. And then last week, we talked about how we can take our cue from Christ. We looked at the 12, not the disciples. I'm going to call them the 12 because that's the point. It was a community and how Jesus not only preached community to the people, he created community to teach us what it truly looked like. And what we learn from watching Christ is that connection all comes from one thing, love, true love, divine love. Again, not the butterfly, romanticized love. This is the real, true love that desires good for the other. The power of the 12 came from their connection with Christ and their connection with one another. Sound familiar? It should, because as that, it, that, that's exactly what Christ said the way was the way that they were supposed to live out the prophet and the law. Remember last week we read the greatest commandments, right? Love God, love others. 
Jesus spent his entire ministry creating, loving, and then entrusting his new community to bring the world into unity with not only his father, but with each other. The unity that he wanted to happen is found in his prayer at the Garden of Gethsemane, isn't it? May they be unified as you and I are unified right? That was Christ's prayer of unity in the Garden of Gethsemane less than 24 hours before he dies. May they be unified the way that we're unified. Jesus' final prayer for the community that he set up, the community that we now call the church, is for us all to be able to love each other and love God. Remember the cross, love God, love others. Now today, I want to spend some time being practical. You all know me pretty well at this point, that one of the things that I believe is crucial to a series or even just a a good sermon is for it to have a practical part. Up to this point, I hope I've kind of laid the foundations for why connection is not only a good thing, for a Christian, but it's a necessary thing for a human, right? Regardless if you're Christian or not, it is necessary for all people. And let's face it, for some people, it's easier to create connections than others, isn't it? But actually, I kind of want to debunk something today. I want to debunk a fallacy that most people have. If I were to ask you, what kind of person has the easiest time finding, creating, and keeping connections, wouldn't you say that's an extrovert, right? Most of us think, oh, that's extroverts. They go into a party and they come out with 20 new friends. Or the story of a good friend of mine who uh, his wife continues to say that no matter where he is, he continually has a baby with him because everyone gives their baby to him because he's such so trustworthy and so friendly that he ends up with children. It's a great statement. It's a beautiful statement. But we think, okay, if, but then you think, oh, well, if I'm an introvert, it's going to be a lot harder for me to start connections, right? So that's going to be the difficult part. And What I want to tell you is that while extroverts might be better at initiating connections, extroverts are notorious for not being able to go very deep in those connections. Those connections are superficial. They're friendship. They're the casual relationship. Like that bag of Legos, they're not the connected piece. Now, I'm not saying that they can't, but just because someone is quick to make a friend doesn't mean that they are quick to make a connection. Remember what I told you was the easiest way to tell if you had a connection with someone is to think about how long of a conversation would come if you asked the simple question of how is your day going, what's going on with you, or let's just use the Wesleyan question, right, how is it with your soul? But that's just the first step. That's the initial test. As we learned last week, connection is far more than just talking for a few hours. Trust me, I'm a pastor. I can talk for hours on hours on end. You can ask my wife about that. We can t- I, I could talk for hours on end. The question is a whole two hours of stuff you never actually at, cared about, right? If you ask me that question, I'm going to be able to tell you as my life story. Are we connected? No. I just can talk your ear off. The reason that the question is an important tool for finding out if you have a connection isn't the isn't the que- isn't the statement of well that we have a four hour long conversation afterwards. It's what happens after that conversation. Do you follow up? Do you do anything about it after listening to their woes? After listening to what's going on in their lives, do you offer advice? Do you help walk with them? Do you work with them, or do you like or do you say? That was a really nice conversation. I'll I'll see you next week. That's where the connection comes in. Remember when we started this series, I used Legos? Well, get ready to use them again, all right? Think about that Lego piece in your head for a second. Now, if you think about a Lego piece, more than likely, the basic piece that almost everyone thinks of is the four by two brick. 
four bumps in two rows, right? Those bumps are what allow the Lego brick to connect to other Lego bricks. And as I said before, we are a lot like Legos, even more so than you'd think. Now, this particular brick that has four bumps in two rows will never be able to connect to anything more than at most eight different bricks, because that's how many bumps there are, right? But to be fair, if, they, if the brick only had a connection with a Lego on one bump, it wouldn't be a very strong connection, would it? Would it? it would be connected, but it would be rather easy to break those connections off, wouldn't it? Only by holding on to one bump, yeah, they probably fall off pretty, pretty easily. So more than likely, that one brick that has eight bumps on it will be connected to less than eight, probably maybe two or three or four bricks. The less bricks you use, the more solid the connection is, right? Are you seeing where I'm kind of going with this analogy? If you came into this sermon thinking that you were doing good because you had thought about this, you had answered that question that I had given to you last week and said, okay, I have 20 people that I can go to and ask, how are you doing? How is it with your soul? And we will have a deep conversation with each other. You are either an extraordinary human being or you actually don't have that many connections. And let me just go ahead and tell you that as much as I believe that every person is extraordinary, you probably just don't have that many connections. And then back in the 1990s, uh, a British anthropologist by the name of Robin Dunbar was doing his dissertation, was doing his scientific research, and noticed that there was a remarkable correlation between primate brain size and the social groups that they formed. And this correlation was pretty simple. The bigger the brain, the larger the social group. And the explanation seemed pretty reasonable. Animals with bigger brains can remember and therefore interact meaningfully with more of their peers. He used his research to determine that humans could have no more than 150 people in their social sphere. That's 150 people whom they call friends and acquaintances co-workers, family members, friends, acquaintances. So you say, sit there and tell me that you have a Facebook list of over 1,500 friends. No, you don't have 1,500 friends. You barely have 1,500 acquaintances because I can guarantee you that you cannot name for me all 1,500 people of those friends lists without actually going to the friends list and scrolling down, right? 150 is the max. But here's where it actually got really interesting. As I said, that was back in the 1990s. He's had a number of years to work on it, to perfect it, to do more research, to get a lot more data. And so as he continued to do that, what he found was that within that 150, so take this, take, take that circle, right? That, that encompasses all 150 people that are in your social sphere, right? He realized that there were layers, there were circles within the circle. The outermost layer, the one that had the most people in it, the one that encompassed literally all 150 because it encompasses all the other circles, had about 100 people in it. These are people that are on the, per that, that are on the peripheral of your social circle. You may recognize them by their first name. You may not even recognize them by their name, but you may recognize them by their face. You may recognize them by one story that you have with them, that kind of thing. And you probably don't talk with them or interact with them on a very regular basis. The next circle has 35 people within it. These are people that you might interact with on a semi-daily basis, maybe once a week or so. You have a connection, you have a, a, a relationship with, but it's not really a connection. You know their names, though. The next circle has 10 people in it. This is getting real close to the center, right? Real close to the center. 10 people. These people you interact with on a daily basis. These are people that you think about. These are people that you know them by name. 
But here's the kicker. Then you have the inner circle. And he said in his research, he found that this inner circle contained five people. Five people who you would call your BFFs. Now, of course, with any science like this, the number is general, right? Not everyone has five best friends. Some people will only be able to accommodate having two or three. Others might be able to have even six or even seven. But you can't go much beyond that number. And would you like to know why? Well, the fact is, is that we find it in our scripture. No, I didn't forget about the scripture this morning. I wanted to lay this groundwork before we got here. Our scripture this morning is how to work with your brother and sister, especially when they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Okay? Reproving your brother or sister. And if I want to put it in terms of what we're talking about right now, it's the reproval of our BFFs, those that are in our inner circle, those four to six people in our inner circle. The scripture tells us first and foremost that when a person is faltering, you must go confront them. Now, please hear me because I've said this so many times, but it bears repeating, all right? You cannot, hear me, you cannot point out a sin in another person's life without first having a connected relationship with that person. It can't happen. It will always, always, always be perceived as judgment, which is something that you do not have the hammer to swing for. A connected relationship is needed in order to correct because the correcting, because that's a difficult premise. The person that is receiving the correction needs to understand, needs to know, needs to truly know that you have their best interest at heart, that you truly do love them, that you're not just sticking your nose up in the air at them, but you are with them. But here's the second thing. Correcting is the job of fellow Christians because we will never make it through this life without the aid of both God and our siblings in the faith. Remember that whole thing, love God, love others? We have to have that connection. We have to have those people. Now, let's apply this needed relationship to the promise that Jesus makes to us here, right? Because it goes through this whole scripture. This is how you're supposed to prove someone. Go to them one-on-one. Go to two, two and three-on-one. Go to the church. Then if they can't, then if they don't do it, uh, fix what they're doing, then you, uh, not necessarily, and, and this is where the difficult part is, it's not that you excommunicate. It's not that you kick them out. It's the fact that you put them to the side. You still love them. You still work on them. You still continue to interact with them, but you don't allow the sin that they're living in to affect the way that you live. Does that make sense? I hope so. Because he says that you're supposed to act like they're a Gentile or a tax collector. But notice what Jesus did throughout his ministry. Who did he eat with? Who did he associate with? Who did he walk around with? Who did he heal? Who was in his inner circle? Who was in his twelve? tax collectors and Gentiles, right? All throughout his ministry. So by saying treat them like a Gentile or tax collector doesn't mean kick them out and hate them forever. Kick them out and never have anything to do with them ever again. No, it means to minister to them. It means to love them. It means to desire them to come into the relationship with God the way that you have a relationship with God. That's what it means. But apart from all of this, at the very end, it's a phrase that we love to say in the church, right? When two or three are gathered in my name, I will be with you, right? We say this all the time. Now, I never want to say, before I go much further, I never want to say that Jesus won't be somewhere because let's face it, he's everywhere. That's the point, right? He's always inside of us. He's always with us, no matter where we go. That's kind of the hope, right? That's that. That's the beauty and the peace that comes from God is that Christ is 
always with us. But in light of this passage and what Jesus has just been talking about, I want to understand this passage, th this phrase through the lens of this passage. What I believe Jesus is trying to say is something very important in the way of connection. Because Jesus says, if you and your brother or sister are connected to each other, and each of you are connected to me, then guess what? I'm going to be in the midst. I'm going to be in the middle of this whole confrontation. I'm going to make sure that this confrontation doesn't go, go doesn't get derailed. I'm going to make sure this confrontation doesn't become infectious. I'm going to make sure this confrontation becomes glorious, it becomes salvific. It becomes beautiful because both members are going to grow in their relationship, not only with each other, but with me, in which case you're going to be growing with the father. Now, let me give you a hint real quick. This kind of relationship, this kind of confrontation, what the scripture just talked about, about coming and meeting with your brother or sister, it does not happen in the streets. It doesn't happen in the pew. It doesn't happen in the hallway. And it certainly does not happen in the parking lot. This kind of relationship, this kind of conversation, this kind of beautiful bringing together of followers of Christ that desire the love and growth of their brothers and sisters, that kind of relationship happens in the small group. Now, yes, this is the time when I'm going to plug being part of a small group of people dedicated to growing in their faith. Now, this small group is an intentional, intimate, dedicated, personal small group. It's the place where true, holy connection happens. And please do not take this, to, take this the wrong way. A small group is not a Bible study. All right? A Bible study is a group dedicated to learning the Bible. A small group is a group dedicated to strengthening their faith in Christ. Now, sometimes that means, yes, studying the Bible, but it means so much more than that. Bible study is always a part of that, but more important is how you are living, not what you are living by. I've known countless people in my, work, in my ministry and in my life that can quote thousands of lines of Scripture and live atrociously. And I've known others that can't give me anything more than John 3.16 and live closer to God than anyone I've ever known. It's not how you are, li it's, it, it's more important of how you live than what you're living by. Because if you have all these rules, if you know all the rules, but you don't follow them, what good are the rules? What good are those, pro, are those, are, are those moral uh, statements if you don't live by them? And what small groups do is they give you the chance to grow in ways that you've, ne you've been trying to grow for years, but you haven't been successful. Think about it. Just let's take faith out of the question for a second. If you, have you ever tried to lose weight by yourself? Have you ever looked in the mirror and gone, goodness gracious, I need to lose some weight. I'm going to do it now. After two weeks, are you still on your diet? No, probably not. After two weeks, are you still in the gym working out? No, probably not. After two weeks, are you running around the neighborhood still in your jogging, in, in your shorts and t-shirts? No, probably not. Because you're by yourself. There's no accountability. There's no one that's pushing you. There's no one that's telling you you need to get out there and do it when you don't want to, because I guarantee you in those first two weeks, there's going to come a time that you're like, I don't want to do that. And in this heat, you'd never want to get outside, right? It's darn near impossible to do it by yourself. But have you ever tried to lose weight with partner or group? I'm not saying that it's easier to lose the weight, but at some level it is because then you have those people that call you and say, did you get out today? No, get your butt off the couch and go. Did you eat well today? I had a hamburger instead of salad. Didn't kick the food out and get to get yourself ready to go. We having someone that's going to kick your butt when you don't do the right thing is so important. It doesn't make it easier, but it makes it 
bearable. And see, in our faith, the same thing. Small groups allow you to connect deeper, to use your God-given talents to be cared for and to be held accountable all at the same time. In the end, what the small group does, is it teaches you to love at a level that you will never get to on your own. You want to truly connect to God? You want to truly connect like God created you for? Here's what you do. You go and find a group of four to eight people. Notice the size, right? That's an inner circle. That is the size of an inner circle. Go find yourself a group of four to eight people who will love you, who will challenge you, who will grow you. And I, let me tell you this. I guarantee you, and you don't hear me say this very often, right? I very rarely say that it 100% will work, but I can guarantee you this. If you do, if you go and be proactive and find that group, that inner circle of people, you will find that your connection with God, not just with those people, your connection with God will be stronger than it ever has been in your life. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it is so easy for us to get caught up in the fact that we have all these friends and acquaintances to be around but so many of us have no inner circle. We don't have those three to five people that we can share, share our entire lives, people that we can openly and honestly tell them of our mistakes, our sins, our problems, our temptations, all the things that we are so scared about in our lives, which means that invariably we go at it solo. We expect that you're with us, but we don't have anyone else walking beside us. And Father, you told us from the very beginning that human beings should never be alone. Not alone in the sense that you won't be with us, but alone in the sense that we won't have another fellow human being beside us. We need both. And so, Father, part of our prayers is to continually show yourself to us, continually let us feel your presence so that we always know that you're here. But on top of that, to give us the strength and the courage to find those that are going to be part of our inner circle, guide them into our lives so that we can build ourselves into better versions of ourselves, that we might become better followers and better tools for the building of your kingdom. We pray all this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I hope you've had a wonderful worship service here on our YouTube channel. Again, if you haven't done so already, hit the like button and the subscribe button here on the channel. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Have a great 4th of July, and I look forward to seeing you in church in the next couple of weeks, or at the very least here on our YouTube channel for our next worship service. May God bless you this next weekend.